G'day YouTube viewers. <laughs> Mine's Pete. I've uh, been breeding fish for six or seven years now. Got into it because my daughter decided she wanted fish and then a couple of months later she didn't want fish and then I've now I've got this little raging empire. <laughs> A year ago, I think Nick done a video, a YouTube video over here. I wasn't even half as many tanks back then, but yeah, as, as everyone out there in YouTube land and, and fish nut land knows, it's very, very addictive and um, you just keep going and going and going. <laughs> so how many tanks do you have? I think last count I got 40. I stopped counting for a while. Yeah, but I tell everyone 40. <laughs> when you're keeping an aquarium, how do you like to do it? Naturally, you know what I mean? like. I'm not going to sit here and knock anyone's way of doing anything because everyone's way, you, you've got to work out what's right for you in your own situation. I do love the natural substrates, but in saying that, pretty soon I'm going to try the bare bottom, basically before maintenance purposes. I don't think it's going to really worry the fish. If anything, it's going to keep the tank cleaner. The reason I love substrates is because it gives, you can have more um, bacteria going on. There's that, that aspect, the mulm can, find a place to go and I do find that the substrate actually helps the plants along by supporting them with the nutrients that they need to grow. That's kind of excited me a lot right now. I'm trying to get into that more and more. The plant situation I absolutely, I've always loved. Sometimes even the simplest of plant absolutely eludes me. I think it's Eleonora or whatever. El Elodia. Elodia. <laughs> I'm not good with the names, yeah. but Elodia. Elodia. Everyone grows it, right? Everyone. Boy, that eluded me for a long, long time. Tried everything. But what I do find too with aquariums or fish tanks is that sometimes you can suffocate or kill stuff with kindness. So I was doing things and I was probably doing too much. Now I've got a tank going over here with a lady is going absolutely berserk and I'm in love with it. You've got a massive fish room here. I mean, you've got 40 tanks. The main highlight of the room for me is your neon tetra breeding. Well, yeah. not neon tetra breeding, but tetra breeding in general. I love breeding nano fish. I love the little fish. I got respect for all fish. I don't go into the land of cichlids and things like that, not because I don't like them or love them, it's because if I did that, I'd need another 40, 60 tanks easily. Uh, it is an addiction, as we all know, as anyone out there knows. So I sort of stick to the nano fish because I love, I love the challenge of breeding little fish. They're small, they're cheap, they're affordable for nearly everyone that's coming in and out of the, well, coming into the uh, aquarium. And, industry and they do look really good. These are my latest mob of semi-adult rummy nose tetras. I bred these. This is like a midway to a grow tank, I call it, because I, I like to get them in a tank like this, give them food, and they learn to accept humans, I guess. Yeah, they're exactly. not shy. No, no, look at them, they come up to the glass, and that's yeah. what you want, right? You know, like, if you've got a, a nice presentation tank, you want them to come up to the front. You want to see them, you don't want them hiding behind the back. The cool thing about this tank is you bred all these fish. Yeah. I have trouble breeding these types of fish, I just do. Mm. So I want you to walk us through exactly yeah. how you do this. I'm not an expert. Experts just drip under pressure anyway, but I'm not an expert and I'm not a master breeder. I'm none of that. I'm just a little amateur sitting in my shed and on my garage and having a really good time with it. I love it. It's like one great big scientific project, although it's, it is, but it isn't. It's, it's just a great big hobby and I absolutely love it. And it just seems like there's no boundaries to what you can you can achieve with stuff like, you know, you go and go, and you think you've got something right, and all of a sudden you haven't got it right, so then you're back to the drawing board. Or you've done something right, and you try to do it again, and you try to mimic it a couple of times, and when you do that a couple of times, it works out for you a couple of times, it's happy days. It's really, it's really, um, it, it's rewarding. That's the word I'm trying to find. I will lose words here and there, because I'm old. <laughs> anyway, I muck around with the, the cheap fish because people getting into this, this, the, the aquarium industry, now there, there's lots of different types of people. People are gonna come along and they wanna buy 10 fish for $6.50 each because they don't really wanna do a big outlay and whether they fail or succeed is up to them, how much time and effort they're going to put in. A lot of people don't understand cycling tanks is a huge part, it's huge. All fish nuts know that about the cycling and new people getting into this, they really don't understand the cycling aspect of everything. I muck around the cheap ones, that way I can maybe supply the cheaper fish, Danios, Neons, Rummy Nose, all those cheaper fish, I can supply them 
and, but I can supply them to people and it can be like a, um, a more personal thing. For you, it's not really about making money. It's no. more your community. Definitely, definitely not making money. I love doing it. I love seeing the fish drop the eggs. I love seeing the, the fry emerge. Then I love seeing the fry start to feed. And then I love seeing the fry go onto the bigger food and then get bigger and then turn to something like these blokes over here, nearly ready for sale. You're also big into live food. Yeah, I love live food. Not as a staple, I guess. I'd like to be as a, a staple. With fry, absolutely. Infosoria, I swear by Infosoria. Walter worms, micro worms, I swear by those. Once those fish start moving around, I find even mature tetras, you'll chuck Walter worms or micro worms in, and I know they're fatty, 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 but if you think about it, a teenager these days, if you if you chuck out a bowl of twisties, they would just lose their mind over it and eat it and eat it until it's gone. Well, I find, I, I feel it's the same with um, like a teenage tetra or something like that. You chuck some Walter worms in there, it's like dropping a bag of twisties in. They do, they go berserk, and they chase them to the end, to the end of the tank. They just keep going and going till there's nothing left. Because you have quite a stressful job. I'd consider it more stressful, but you're a firefighter. Yeah, I'm a firefighter for Queensland Fire and Emergency. It's the best job in the world. <laughs> I'll say that every day of the week, and I work with the best bunch of people in the world. Firefighters in general are really, really great people. I get goosebumps when I even say that, but it's definitely true. It took me half of my life to get to be a firefighter, and uh, yeah, it is great. It can be stressful at times. We see things, but you know, we all know what we're in for before we become that person, but I'll tell you what, it's so rewarding every single day. In life, I find everything, if you're talking about a job, and I do talk to people about fish tanks, and they say, oh, I had a fish tank once, but it was too much work. If you start thinking of something as work, you're not gonna enjoy it. If you see it as a challenge, and you're looking, focusing more on the rewards, then it's not gonna be a job. I think anyone that's getting into this hobby has got to think like that, I guess. And you know, Nick, you, you, you do a little bit of work somewhere and you get big rewards from it. Fish start really growing well and they look really healthy and they swim around. I can always tell when one of my fish tanks isn't going so well because the fish aren't coming to the front as soon as I walk in, they're not responding. So I can just go straight up and look at that tank and say, yeah, that needs some sort of work, whether it's a water change or gravel vac or the filters need to be replaced or things like that. The biggest part of success of breeding neon tetras or any tetras or any nano fish or any fish really is the beginning food. So after they've hatched and they've turned into fry, going from fry to a size where they start eating some solid food, that bit of food, that food is emphasoria. So we'll start off with the food rather than the breeding. Yes. My emphasoria is going all the time. This tank of emphasoria has been going probably two years now. At first it really smells. There is a bit of smell about it, but it's not too bad. It's well vented over the top. This is my, one of my, I've got two Infosuria tanks. This is a very good one at the moment. I haven't fed this for possibly three, four weeks since I had baby tetras. It's still going berserk. Now, all I do with this, I leave it like this, go and go and go and have a good cover on it so that the um, mosquitoes don't get into it because once mosquitoes get in it, they'll destroy it. So you keep it going like that. When you know you're gonna go breeding fish, you put a piece of broccoli in there. You boil broccoli for two or three minutes and then chuck it in the top. And like within a day, this thing will be going berserk. I mean, it's berserk now, but once you put fresh broccoli in there, it just goes berserk. You can nearly not even see through it. And you've um, had this colony for two years, you said? Yeah, the infosoria have been gone for two years. One of them I had to destroy because the cover must have got dislodged or something and a damn mosquito got in it. Next thing you know, it's full of mosquito larvae. Right -o. That's okay, it's always good to refresh. The important thing here is you start out with this food. To me, you have to have live food. I've tried fry starter. It, probably works a little bit, but nothing like that. Live food with all fish, just it agitates the fish to eat. Even if they're not hungry, they just get agitated and they eat it. The thing about fish is the more they eat, the more they grow and, and the more they want to eat, obviously, the more they grow. So if you put something in there that just doesn't interest them at all, you can put a flake in there and if they're really hungry, they'll give it a go. And that can be a stable diet and it can be the best, you know, your best of your means. But if you can do baby brine shrimp or something alive like that, you put it in there and it just moves around and agitates them to the point that they, they, they might not even be hungry. They'll just smash it. Also something like a different aspect of the fish you enjoy is the hunting. Watching them hunt in the tank yeah. is really cool too. So yeah, because they don't really hunt down flakes or anything, but they do hunt down 
worms. And that's it. That's exactly right. So you start out with your live food yep. first before yep. you do any breeding. You just make go... sure you got that. Okay, make cool. sure you got it. All right. What's the next step? You pick yeah. out some breeders. So then you, you, if you haven't got any, go to the pet shop, get yourself a couple of nice fish, feed them up. If you know. come to my shop right now, we've got some of your local bred cardinals still. Oh yeah. I kept them up really high price because I just knew that they're not worth four dollars. They're worth ten. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I, mean? I had a lot of success with um some cardinals. They went great, and I used the technique of taking them out of one tank in the next, in the next, in the next, like four, five days in a row, and they dropped eggs each day, and each tank seemed to get more eggs or more fry emerged after a few days of doing that. It's like a marathon effort, and then you put them back into the, the big community tank and let them just live their lives and, and be happy, feed them as much as you can, and make them as happy as you can. So you start out with probably six good parents, Try to pick out males and females. 50-50 ratio? Yeah, 50-50. You put six in, you might get one male that's really keen and you might get one female that's really keen. We're not talking about as well today, like the sexes of all the fish. No. You'll have to go and research that yourself because every tetra is different. But yeah, normally like plump ones are female, yeah. skinny ones are male. With most tetras, use that as a rule of thumb. So you pick out your six and then yeah. you take them to your little yeah. factory up so here. I've been working with a group of four tanks. They're different size tanks. I kind of did that on purpose. I sort of figure that some fish might breed in a deeper tank or fatter tank or shallower tank. So I four different ones. What I normally do, I'll put the parents in here for two to three days. This is already in. full of babies too. Yeah, glow light tetras. With this, I just did a two cycle stint. So I put the glow lights in here, got them out after three days, didn't even look for wrigglers at first, chucked them over here, thought I was getting success with this. Nothing eventuated with this one. Turned out I did have one, here he is. <laughs> Yeah, cutie. My own soldier. He's cool. He's bigger than the ones in the other tank and he's younger. So there you go. So what I normally do, chuck them in there two to three days, move them to this one, two days, put in this one, two days, and then that one, two days, and then get them back into their um into their home. Each of these tanks is mm. about, I'd say, 15 litres. 15 to 20. This one might be a 20, 20, 25. Small tanks. What I've done with all these tanks, they're about, about 25 degrees. 25 to 27 degrees. Celsius, um, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> Aussie. About that temperature, made a mistake with that in the early days, it was a bit too cool. A little bag of peat moss and an Indian almond leaf. I muck around a bit with the moss and I also muck around with the, um, the spawning mops. I can't tell you which one's better. I do find that with the moss, there's more for the infusory to live on. I don't know if it requires it. Uh, a lot of people, uh, they do bare bottoms and they don't even do a filter, you know, and they get success. But this is just my way. My current little uh, project that I'm trying to get going is uh, some tanks. Somebody on one of the uh, comments was saying, I can't believe you're still running canister filters. I really thought canister filters were the be all end all uh, because I haven't got a, an automatic water change system like your elaborate one. I, I marvel at that sort of stuff. I look at Adrian's, I look at all the ones you've done videos on and I, I've got to say, I feel a little bit dwarfed by those guys, uh, but I look up to them and it's really good to see that stuff it really is I'm, I'm actually taking a lot of that stuff on board i'm trying to do a bit more planning and stuff like that the thing with tetras is they breed in the morning yes and that's the other reason i got in this position because this is next to the window so the sun comes through there in the morning and they do they go berserk once that sun comes through that window I, i'll come into the coffee and i just sit there and and you watch them they go on nuts and you know they're doing stuff i think I, I did see him spray eggs once, like once. Oh, I was so over the moon. I saw it once and I saw it, I got it on camera. Yeah, did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that yeah, would have been gold. That was so that good. That would have been gold. I did take a photo of some eggs on top of a sponge filter one time. Pretty happy about that. I sat in front of the tank for an hour. <laughs> Another thing about them, yep. they're in rainwater too, right? All rainwater. I think personally, you cannot breed tetras without rainwater. Yeah. It's soft, so it's got no mineral really in it and the pH is nice and low. That's right. And once they go from a normal tank, which is up around the seven pH, they come out of that, go straight into rainwater. For some reason, I think that is one of the things that spurs them on to actually breeding. So obviously that's a good thing. You need them to start. Yeah. Yeah. You condition the parents to, they get lots of live food and... I really spoil them. I love, I love feeding them. I, I breed a lot of live food, big white worms and wild worms to a point, they do smash there because I've got an abundance of them. And I give them a good smashing of um, baby brine shrimp when I get them going properly. And that's all the time. So they're pretty much conditioned up. All you gotta do is just have a look and you'll see some, of them. like I've got some glow lights in there. They're so big, they are so big. I'm feeling terrible because I'm not getting them out to breed. But when they do get out to breed, they go berserk. There's another thing too that you gotta watch out. Yeah. You can over condition because some of them, they'll lay eggs and 
they can be rotten in their belly. That disheartens people too, you know, like you do it, oh, I'm just not doing it right, oh well. And I'll tell you, it's disheartened me a few times too. But the system of having four tanks, if you've got a fish with a belly full of old eggs and they're not fertile and they're not gonna be fertile, they can drop them in the first one. The second one, they might have a couple and the third one, they get better. And the fourth one, you know, out of four tanks, you might get 150 fish and you put a bit of live food in with them, they start realizing that there's a food source, there's the right water parameters, there's the right environment, the whole lot, and they're happy. With this, I really wanted to play with rummy nose, so I split it, I put glow lights in these two, and this one here, I put rummy nose, and I moved them over there. And this one here, I thought they went berserk, because this was the second tank, and they were all very frisky, and they were going berserk on the spawning ritual, and plenty of rocks, the whole lot, it was all good. And I was sure, when I got them out, I was sure, I looked in here and I seen some fry falling. I'll just shine on the, on the weed. And if there's fish there, they'll just fall straight into the rocks. Hey, look, I've got two in there. I thought I only had one. Oh, we're not. <laughs> there you go. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but once I see a few fry dropping, I know I've got some sort of success. So happy days. So with this one, I thought this was gonna be highly successful because I've seen a few. I thought, ooh, I'm gonna get one in here. And so I just found out I only got two. I didn't think I had any. I drained the tank, I was going to have another go. I drained it down about 90%. There was next to no water in it. I refilled it. And as I refilled it, and a fish came up and I got a fish. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you pay for your food, as long as your fish will eat it. So, you know, you just got to try them out. I've got certain fish here. I'll put um, wafers, you know, in the bottom and certain fish you wouldn't think would touch them. They'll sit there and they'll smash them all day until they're gone. And then other fish will think, oh, this is right up that fish's alley. He's gonna love this algae wafer. And it sits there for two days and I gotta pick it out because it's rotten away, you know? You just gotta experiment on your, on your own fish and see what they're gonna eat when you find something. You also treat the parents as you would if, any, if they were in any tank. You also feed them during those two days? Yeah, I feed them only live food in this tank because even the worms, the wilder worms, they do die eventually, but they will live for a fair while. The big thing is after that, like I said to you about the infusoria, once you know there's fry in there, I smash them with infusoria straight away. People say, oh, I'll give them a couple of days, and that's fine, that's the way you do it. But my biggest mistake in the past with me personally, the way I do things, is that I might go to work and not get enough time to feed properly. And I also find with a bit of weed in there, the infusoria lives in the weed and it will predate on the weed. It'll give it a food source to give the fish food source. So it can live in there until the fish is ready to start eating themselves. And they do, they, they, they smash the infusoria. Once I see them up properly targeting, then I really smash them. I really, I'll, I'll squirt out a cup of that infusoria and pour it in there. You'll look in there and there'll be thousands of this stuff on there but in a day's time, it'll all be gone. When you think about the size of the fish and the size of the infusoria, they've got, a lot of, got to eat a lot of that to get a feed. So yeah, you just got to not underdo that bit. That's my mistake in the past. I've do you underfed. do that on day one? No, day one, I probably don't put a cup load in, but on day one, I'll put a lot. I'll put like probably four or five good squirts and it's, it's decent squirts. Like that stuff goes berserk. It's like, yeah, it's well, like How soup. soon after they hatch after they're laid? Oh, next day. As I said, I might leave them in there for two days. I've looked in there, even when they've been in there, and I'm like, whoa, it's even, it hasn't even been, it's been like 12 hours or 24 hours, and, and I've seen a little little um, fry. So I, oh, get them out. And then it's a touch and go, you think, one more day, 50 fish, you know, 30 fish, 50 fish, what are we gonna do? But then they could start eating the young, so, so it's best take, to get them out. You start feeding them infusoria, yeah. then, then what? Pretty much, you keep them on infusoria for five to seven days, but as soon as they start free swimming, as soon as they start coming up, I take them to Walter Worms. Walter Worms, I've had a lot of people um, not give me grief, but they've given me advice for Walter Worms. Now, the Walter Worm advice I got was, you know, the oats smells, right? And we're gonna get a bit of smell in a minute. People have said to me, um, what about powdered potato, you know? And okay, I took that advice, I give it a go. One bag of potato does three of these, and it's $6. One bag of oats is $2.70, and it does 12 of these things. The powdered potato, I don't get any production for about four or five days, and even then, it's nowhere near as good as this. This is nice and thick around here. This is very old, by the way. But oh, it's... yeah, you can smell it. <laughs> oh, come on, mate. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, it's gonna get worse. Like, this is bad because I'm a lazy bugger. Um, instead of going and making up some new oats and, and a bit of um, yeast, and I've only learned this recently, you put a couple of slices of bread in and the worms go berserk again. They smash it and they start coming up the side like this again. So you get a second life out of the same thing. 
Look, yeah, it does smell, but it's up high and I only do it once a day. It's a necessary evil and I'll try it's to- It's a tiny little microscopic worms almost. So that there, there's like a lot of worms on that. Now these ones here, they've just had a feed, but they will go to the circuit again. So a little bit of thing. Now you can see all those worms in there and these guys. The Walter worms are one thing. You can see their belly's getting fat, but I'll tell you what, when you give them baby brine shrimp, their bellies go really big and orange, and that's that's a really good thing to see. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of, you know they're feeding when they're like that. Like I've sort of said in the past, fish can eat micro worms or Walter worms right up till their adult stage. Feed them that twice a day. You can get away with one once, but don't make a habit of once. In the wild, you know, you see those, those the, the videos of the sharks running through the big schools of pilchards. This shark is two and a half metres long. The pilchards are like this big, you know, like something like that. And they're still going through and getting as many as they can, even though they don't catch too many, they're still in there doing it, you know? So fish will eat whatever they can get. That's the bottom line, they're scavengers, you know? Also, when you use live food, you said you catch bigger fish as well. Yes, live baiting is my favourite. It's just, it's very exciting fishing, live baiting. But it shows you, I mean, if you chuck flakes on the end of your hook. You chuck a dead prawn on, it could soak there for two days, you know? You chuck a live prawn on, just hook the thing, and he's wriggling around, Fish aren't stupid, like whether they're tank fish or ocean fish, they're not stupid. And especially the big ones, they didn't get big because they're stupid. They got there because they're smart. Now, we've all got a budget and I do buy fresh food all the time, whether it's flake or granules or whatever. But you know, every so often I'll be at the market and someone will be selling a whole bunch of things like this, you know? It's cheap. I bought a whole bunch of those for $10. I mean, great. They're out of date by six months. I'll put them in some tanks and some fish just won't go near it. Other fish will. After that, you pretty much just keep them going. And, and they, they go at this stage. You gotta do water changes. I do it like a, maybe a 20% water change, probably every second week. Some people say you gotta do it every second. No, I do it every second week. They seem to be okay with that. I, I've never really lost baby fish because of water change, like the lack of water changes. And I don't know if it's cruel, they seem to be happy. All I know is that if they're coming out feeding and they're swimming freely like they are now, I, I think I'm doing the right thing. Nah, um, mate, you're crushing it. And, and I'm, I'm not losing them. So I'll get from this stage, I'll go off to the intermediate grow tank. And I, I sort of feel that in that intermediate stage, I'm sort of training them to be house pets. They So they come from here? Yeah, from here. They'll come over to this. And then I'll, I'll start teaching them how to eat. I, I go to grindle worms. I breed grindle worms. I've got a, I've got a half or a dozen um, little vats of grindle worms. I put a bit of glass, some cat food, glass down. The grindle worms get on the glass. Then I just take the glass. I mean, there's a bit of peat moss on there. Yeah, so they grow in peat moss. Yeah, pretty much. They, At room temperature. They actually don't really go into it. They sit on top, but it's a good medium for them. They do like it. So they're longer worms. Um, even these guys here, will give them a touch up. I can put them in there and the bigger ones will smash them. Smaller ones I'll have a go. You'll have a small one and have a worm hanging out of its mouth and it'll be swimming around the place like a nut. From this, I take them out of the intermediate, I call it intermediate grow tank. And I just, you know, you give them a bit of this, watch these guys go. They love it. They just wow. smash it. It's and full of amazing fat. It's whatever you gut load them with. So yeah. that dog food, all the meat and all that stuff that's mount, smashed up into it, they're gonna eat that through the worm. Weirdly enough, the, oh, it's cat food. I give them dog food too, but the worms seem to eat the green ones. And I don't know if the green ones are actually vegetables or whatever, but they don't. They do eat the red ones, but um, not as much as the green ones. So I'm sort of thinking it's like a bit of a vegetarian diet, so to speak, in a roundabout way, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. But all I know is that these buggers love their worms and you know, like that little bloke there, I'm feeling so, sorry for him, but anyway. Oh, whatever, he's just trying to eat. Is that basically the whole process? Pretty much, yeah. And, and after that, they can go into the big grow tank down the bottom and then off to Mark or any, you know, like if I want to sell it privately or, or put them through your shop if you're looking at putting these things on your, on your, um, on your always list. Looking. Yeah, always looking. yeah, and I'm always looking to get rid of them. Um, thing is, I'm not looking at making money. This is just me having fun. And it does actually pay for the food because most of these fish here do eat flake and crumb and all the rest of that. And I'm always like, you have been for the last, you know, eight years or six years that I've been watching, you're always trying something new all the time. And I'm, I'm pretty much trying something new all the time. So, you know, sometimes it's good to actually be able to pay for that, like get the hobby to pay for itself sometimes. I, I do love it. I mean, I, I absolutely love all of this sort of stuff. 
Thank you very much. And I hope this method can help some people out. The worm thing and the infusoria thing, and even the brine shrimp, it can be a little bit daunting. At times you can sort of think, oh Jesus, that's all too hard. Everything in life can be too hard if you tell yourself it's too hard. But if you just say, I can do that, well, you know, give it a go. And YouTube got me hooked, watched um, Mark's Aquatics and a few others, and, and yourself, you know, stuff you've been doing in the earlier days, oh, I watched stuff you were doing, oh, I'm going to give that a go, you know? And you take a, a bit of that information, a bit of that information, put it all together. Like I said earlier, I'm not an expert. I'm not, I'm no Dean, somebody called me Dean. <laughs> got the same hairline, it's about it. But I think if you can do something three and four times and get it the same each time, you're getting something right, you know? That's the bottom line. You are getting something right if you're getting the right result each time. That's my tetra breeding cycle from go to woe. I mean, look, honestly, there's probably a better way and there's probably a way that you can get a lot more yield. I mean, there's probably 40 fish in there. You know, my last cardinal tetra thing was 100, 120, something like that with the same method, but you know, I just don't really want to stick to the one, which I should be. But anyway, I'm-, I'm It's a hobby for you. Yeah, it's fun, so. It's a hobby, it's fun. And also I'm setting things up so things can be moved on to the next stage easy. Yeah. And that's what it's all about, isn't it? Keep it as, keeping fish simple, you know? Yeah. Keep it as simple as you can and easy and, and enjoyable. Once it's not enjoyable, you're going backwards. Well, right. thank you so much for showing us. And Nick, uh, always a pleasure, Nick. All yeah. right, <laughs> see you guys. No worries. <laughs>